Have you ever wondered how a radar distinguishes between targets that are close together? Imagine you're on a busy highway with cars right in front of you. Some are in the same lane but moving at slightly different speeds, while others are in different lanes at almost the same distance. A radar must figure out not just how far each car is, but also which lane it's in and how fast it's moving. By the end of this video, you'll see how range, velocity, and angular resolution each work, and how improving one often means making tough trade-offs with the others. And if you leave with more questions or just want more practice, check out the Python notebook in the description to get some hands-on experience, or just let me know in the comments. Let's start by thinking about where this problem emerges with, in my opinion, the most straightforward of the three, range resolution. Most radars work by transmitting a pulse, waiting for the pulse to scatter off a target, and return so it can be measured. In this case, let's say this pulse lasts one microsecond, and we can call this pulse width tau. The wave travels along until it hits the target and some of it scatters back. But say there's another target here, a little after the first, with the distance between the two being delta r. The transmit wave scatters some energy off that target as well. What you'll notice is that this pulse width tau is longer than the time it took to travel between targets 1 and 2, so coming back to the radar, the pulses overlap a bit. When looking at the returns from these signals, this overlap gives us some uncertainty as to how much of the received signal came from which target. If these targets were further apart, it'd be simple to see where one ends and the other begins, but moving them closer makes this ambiguity stronger. The range resolution is the minimum range between targets needed to be able to precisely differentiate between them. But how do we determine this range resolution? Well, as we saw, to not see this overlap, we want this pulse width tau to be less than the time it takes to get from target 1 to target 2 and back. By the way, I want to emphasize this and back in my script. I said it because it really messed me up a lot when I was originally learning this. Since these waves are traveling at the speed of light, dividing delta r by the speed of light will give you the time in seconds it takes to travel from one target to the other. But then it must travel back since we only measure the signal after it's been reflected. So let's add a factor of 2 here to account for that reflection. Now we know that this pulse width tau must be less than the signal's round trip time to avoid the overlap. So we can bring the tau up here and set up this inequality. From here, solving for delta r gives us the range resolution of the radar. Really though, we say that the range resolution is equal to c tau over 2, because it's the minimum range delta that we can detect. What's cool is, it's literally only reliant on the pulse width. So if we plug in this tau equals 1 microsecond that's been sitting here, we find that the range resolution is 150 meters. If you've seen the range resolution equation before though, this might not be what you expect. Oftentimes, this is expressed as a function of the signal's bandwidth instead. So, how do we get it from a function of tau, which is in time, to a function of bandwidth, which is in frequency? We can achieve this using the fundamental relationship between time and frequency. In general, the longer we pulse, the finer the bandwidth resolution gets. And on the other hand, the more bandwidth we use, the finer time resolution we get. This means we can say that our pulse width tau is roughly equal to the inverse of the bandwidth b. Now, this is only exactly equal in ideal systems, windowing, side lobes, and more affect this in real life, so it's just an approximation. Using this, we can say that the range resolution is roughly equal to the speed of light divided by 2 times that bandwidth. This is something I'll dive into more in a later video when I talk about pulse compression because we can actually kind of game this to get good range resolution while also having good maximum range. If we look back at the beam we're transmitting though, we now know how close in range to one another these targets can be. But what about to the left and the right? Or in other words, along theta? Well, this one's not quite as exact because as you can see from this antenna pattern, there's no point where we're actually getting zero returns from the second target. There's points where we get less or near zero reflections, like if the target was placed at one of these nulls here, but it's not as perfect as the range case where the pulse ends and we get no reflections past that time. What's pretty commonly used to approximate the angular resolution is the beam's negative 3 dB beam width, or the point along the pattern where the power is negative 3 dB down, or about half the power from the highest point. 
You could also use the first null beam width instead, which is the width to the first null on either side. Using the 3db beam width, if we're looking at a target and another comes up at an angle outside that beam width, we know that assuming the two targets have the same characteristics, the second target will be at most half the power of the first target, making it much simpler to differentiate between the two. Now, what we want this beam width to be depends on the application, but often system designers will opt for what's called a pencil beam, which is basically just a really thin beam. This allows us to pinpoint specific areas in space and get minimal interference from other targets. For example, often weather radars will shoot for a 1 degree beam width to minimize the volume of particles they're looking at at one point in time. So, given a beam width of 1 degree, let's see how far apart actual targets would be if they're at either end of this beam width, or at the 3db points. From our radar to these two points, we can make a triangle where this angle is the 3db beam width. Cutting it in half gives us a couple of right triangles, and we can just solve for this side using the sine of this angle, which in this case is now half the 3db beam width, equals the side over the hypotenuse. Rearranging, we can get the range on the other side, and this can actually be approximated as just r theta, but I'll explain why in more detail in the Python notebook in the description. Now, what actually controls the beam width of a radar? This could be a whole video in itself, but the two biggest factors are the wavelength and the size of the antenna aperture. In general, the angular resolution improves by getting narrower when you increase the aperture size or use shorter wavelengths. A classic approximation for the angular resolution of a radar is theta is proportional to the wavelength lambda over the antenna's physical size d. So for example, doubling the antenna size cuts your beam width in half, giving you better angular resolution. This is just an approximation though because this can vary a lot depending on windowing and other things done to the antenna. Okay. The last component of resolution we'll talk about is the velocity resolution, and this one's actually pretty different from the previous two. This is the radar's ability to distinguish between two targets by their radial speed, even if they're at roughly the same range. In other words, what is the smallest difference in velocity between two approaching or receding objects that the radar can detect as separate speeds? For example, if one car was moving at 100 kilometers per hour, and another at 105 kilometers per hour, can the radar tell that there are two different speeds, or will it just show up as one average Doppler blur? A common way to measure the velocity is by transmitting multiple sequential waveforms. Once a few of these reflect off the targets, we can take each of these return waveforms and align their starting points. Each of these individual points in time will have some phase difference as you traverse from sample to sample with a magnitude relative to the velocity of the target or targets. This can then be extracted using the Fourier transform, which will give us a frequency spectrum that we can relate to velocity using the Doppler velocity equation to get a velocity spectrum. There's a lot more to it than that. This was a super simple explanation, but I covered this in my previous video on Doppler velocity for FMCW radars, so you can check that out right here. With this velocity spectrum, we can find the velocity resolution. If we were to digitize both of these axes, on this axis, you would have in samples separated by your system's sampling period, TS, which is the inverse of the sampling frequency. Then, along this axis, we have M samples separated by the pulse repetition time, which is the inverse of the pulse repetition frequency, or PRF. Since the sampling frequency is generally much faster than the pulse repetition frequency, TS will be smaller than the PRT, so we can call this the fast time axis, and this the slow time axis. So how do we find the velocity resolution of this? Well, don't we just need to find the distance between each of these discrete velocity cells? I mean, if one target is traveling at a velocity here, and another is traveling at a velocity here, that'll just merge into a single value. We know the number of samples along this axis because it's just the number of pulses we transmit, so if we knew the extent of this axis, we could just take that extent and divide by m to get the difference in velocity between each cell, effectively giving us the velocity resolution. Luckily, the relationship between velocity and Doppler frequency shift is a known formula. Velocity equals Doppler frequency times the wavelength over two. Since we previously took the Fourier transform of this axis, 
the extent will be negative half the sampling frequency to half the sampling frequency, which in this case is negative half the PRF to half the PRF. Putting this all together, we can see that the extent would be PRF over 2 minus negative PRF over 2, which just simplifies to the PRF. Divided by M gives you the frequency difference between each of these cells. From here, that can then be plugged into this frequency term to get the final velocity resolution. And finally, we just found that the minimum difference in velocity between targets we can detect is the transmit wavelength times the pulse repetition frequency over two times the number of pulses that we transmit. Now that we have the three main types of resolution, it may seem from these equations that we're able to change each of these parameters independently. But as always in RF engineering, there's trade-offs even when they're not immediately obvious. One example of this is a trade-off between velocity and range resolution. As we can see from this equation, velocity resolution gets better, or smaller, as we increase the number of pulses m. This effectively increases the amount of time that we're taking measurements, otherwise called the coherent processing interval that I talked about in the FMCW Doppler video. Now, it may not look like it, but in a roundabout way, this actually decreases our range resolution. While the theoretical range resolution is determined by bandwidth or pulse width, in practice, our ability to realize that resolution depends on how finely we sample the returning signal. In this case, since we're increasing the time that we're taking measurements, we're also increasing the maximum unambiguous range. This would be fine if we scaled the number of samples with that increase in range, but if we don't due to signal processing constraints or some other limitation, that same number of samples is stretched across a longer range, making each of the cells larger. This means that while our physical range resolution might not have changed, we're actually sampling at a coarser resolution, so we can't take full advantage of that range resolution. Pretty unfortunate, right? So, like with everything else in radar, we really have to do this dance between all the different metrics we're trying to hit, and eventually you have to make some sacrifices when designing the system. And that pretty much wraps it up. If you want more practice with this, or you just want to mess with some of the other trade-offs, Check out the interactive radar cheat sheet in the description where you can play around with these concepts yourself and solve some practice problems. Like I mentioned in the last video, I just launched a website that I'd love for you to check out. It includes all the resources that I make for these videos, cool merch to show off your radar obsession, and even new channel memberships where you can get access to extended Python notebooks, members only posts, notebook walkthrough videos, and more. I also just want to say a huge thank you to all the people who have already signed up. It's been really cool getting to talk and learn about where you all are in your careers. Let me know what you thought and if there's anything you'd like me to cover in the future. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.